When you're looking at uh, potentially investing in a company and you're, you know, you get that deck, uh, what's the first page you flip to? Interesting. Um, the first page that I flip to, I, I think it depends. If I know it's a SaaS company, then I'll look for the KPIs. Uh, we tend to uh, prefer to invest post uh, product launch and, and some revenue. And so I'll look for some summary of uh, business to date. Um, you know, if it's a marketplace, then just trying to understand the business. And um, so, you know, typically trying to get to some quick KPI summary page would be more often than not uh, what I what I quickly look to. What's like uh, for a SaaS company, the first like, what do you hope to see like in the first four to six metrics on that KPI page, or maybe even just one? I don't know. So um, the the initial KPIs that we look at, if it's a SaaS business, um, really, I would start off or summarize with three categories. Um, the first being momentum uh, that I definitely pay attention to. The second category being retention. Um, the third being efficiency. Um, in terms of momentum, the couple of KPIs that really stand out are one, just the year-over-year -year growth. Um, a three X year-over-year effectively equates to eleven percent, you know, compounded monthly growth rate for twelve months, um, and then the net new ARR per month or per quarter, depending on the sales cycle. Um, and that net new ARR really being, you know, sum of of uh, new ARR plus resurrected plus uh, expansion. Minus contracted, minus churn that you are, um, and we look at that on a last six month period, last three month period, last twelve month, just to note any changes in trends. The second, uh, going back to the second, the categories. The second would be retention, and that's really logo and net revenue uh, retention, which I can get into more detail. And then the third on efficiency is I like the uh, looking at a monthly ratio of sales and marketing spend to new sales ARR. Um, as well as uh, the burn multiple. Um, on the former, typically a one-to-one -one ratio. Um, and for the, the burn multiple, which we define as uh, monthly net burn divided by net new ARR, um, less than two is pretty is pretty compelling. Um, so those are the three that I quickly look for if, if the company obviously has, has that data available. Yeah. Um, do most companies, and, and how do you think about that when they don't? Um, yeah, it varies. It's definitely case by case, as you probably often hear. Um, not many companies may have that quickly accessible, um, although there is definitely a lot more education now and content marketing around that. And so hopefully it becomes, you know, canon and, and everyone can sort of um, agree on how to define those terms and have it readily available. I definitely try to, with the portfolio companies I work with, um, get the data hygiene set up sooner than later so we can have that available in the investor updates or in the board meetings to help drive some of the strategic decisions that we um, want to discuss. Um, I'd say now it's increasingly more often than not, a founder may have uh, some KPIs around that, um, whether it's presented in a manner that um, that we would use is still, you know, still kind of a case by case situation. Um, but at, at this point, I think most SaaS operators and founders understand, you know, what those, what the, uh, those KPIs mean. Yeah. Um, I find that with some of these numbers, it's like possible to twist them in a way that you delude yourself. Um, and I'm wondering whether you see that and if so, like, what's like, maybe like a common way in which people sort of miscalculate or mislook at these metrics and end up diluting themselves. Yeah, I think what I'm used to seeing or something I'm, that commonly seen is um, presenting retention, for example, as a static number. Mm -hmm. And we like to look at that as most investors do, I think on a monthly or quarterly cohort basis, historically speaking. And having a weighted average, you know, per month or per cohort, um, and I think that's a pretty uh, that's kind of common in terms of like seeing maybe that's NRR is presented in a way that doesn't actually capture, you know, per month uh, on a per monthly cohort basis. Um, but that's you know that's solvable yeah. with uh, accessing the raw data, which 
can also be challenged. That's a whole other topic, but yeah. Um, yeah, that's probably the most common one we see. Um, on the cohort, um, cohort question, there's like one thing that I often feel that I think is a misconception. And I'm wondering if you think it's a misconception, which is that if you're an annual business, like your contracts are mostly annual, um, you shouldn't look at cohorts on a monthly level. I disagree, but I'm wondering how you think about it. Yeah, I, I get the sentiment. I think it depends on, you know, is there upsell happening even within the, the year, the first 12 months? So it depends on the pricing model. Um, we certainly are aware of that. If that's the case, if, if um, you know, the ACV doesn't change until month 13 or beyond. Um, but if, you know, the pricing model is set up in a way where there is some upsell opportunity before month 12, um, then we by all means look at it, you know, within the month or, or the first four quarters. Um, so it really just comes down to the company's pricing model, I think. Yeah. The other case I see is like maybe 80% of deals are one year, but then like maybe like another like 10% or six month and then another 10% are like 18 month. Um, and I, I find that so much can be lost when either you're looking at like one number, uh, for net retention or you're like, you know, not digging into, um, monthly or at least quarterly cohorts. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely, it's definitely an interesting point to highlight, um, the mix of annual or the mix of the duration of the contracts. Um, but it, you know, normalizing the NRR and, and logo retention across historical cohorts is just a. Uh, useful exercise, you know, to get to some insights quickly. Yeah. Um, when you're in that like first or second meeting with a potential series A or series B company and you're talking through metrics, how fluent do you expect your CEO, the CEO to be in, in the core metrics? Um, for series A stage. Yeah. A or B. Or B. Oh yeah. So by the time we get to series A and, and this is something that I would also, uh, hope to have for portfolio companies at the series A leading into the series A, um, cause we invest to see the growth. Um, I would say, I would hope that by the series A, uh, especially if we're going out to meeting with new investors or, uh, just new stakeholders who don't have the day-to-day -day context, um, that we have some, some presentation, um, actually of, you know, the net new ARR per month and the historical co cohort representation of our logo and NRR and the takeaways from, you know, what that data might tell us with the understanding that these are trend lines, right? These are, um, you know, sort of to be, uh, cemented in any way they can, they can be, um, data that can be uh, updated, but the hope is that we at least have some directional insights from, uh, presenting that data by the series A. Yeah. And definitely about series B. Yeah. Um, do, do most folks, um, start bringing in their finance teams into those meetings to like talk about metrics or do CEOs typically know it or, um, and, and how do you interpret either of those situations? Mm, I don't, I don't have a, I don't have a, um, personal preference or signal. I don't draw any signal from, yeah. from that at all. Um, you know, it just depends on the founder's, uh, bandwidth or, um, focus area, you know, if their backgrounds aren't, don't lend themselves to being able to be well-versed in, in this, um, uh, arena, then, you know, it doesn't, it's not a, a indicator one way or the other, yeah. um, at least not for me. Um, so as a result, you know, just hire accordingly depending on your, your strengths. Yeah. Um. I think you mentioned like using metrics to talk through board meetings and um, potential future fundraises and stuff like that. Um, how do you think that flows down to, you know, the actual operational cadence of running the companies um, in at least, you know, the companies you work with? Um, and for best in class, what does that mean on an operational level rather than just a board level? That's a good question. I can't say that I'm... Um day-to-day, -day, you know, in the day-to-day -day weeds with all of my portfolio companies. So take this with a grain of salt. Um, but I will say that it is, um, it's a good place to be if we're able to have a conversation with key leaders in our portfolio companies, um, and being able to reference, uh, you know, KPI and run our SAS metrics and 
why that's driving maybe in an, um, a, an operational initiative. Um, uh, maybe it's meeting with the VP of sales and um, defining how we're setting up the sales team and, and why we're doing that and why we're focusing on this particular ICP. Um, so it's helpful to have, I wouldn't say it's, you have an expectation to drive all decisions um, fr from this as well, because there's just a lot more daily context that we lack at the board level. Um, and by no means are we, in my mind, you know, ultimately it's the founder and the team's decisions at the end of the day. And, and these KPIs are just uh, ways for us to um, drive some prioritization yeah. around uh, the operating day-to-day uh, -day operations. Um, so it's uh, entered into some of the conversations with key leaders, but it definitely doesn't consume, you know, by any means, um, those conversations. Yeah. Hmm. Um, we're recording this in June, 2022, and you know, the world is like significantly different than it was in January, 2022 or December, 2021. Um, and I'm curious, like, since so many, so many companies are moving away from the growth at all costs mindset, that is, been the, the norm in tech for the last few years to more um, understanding efficiency metrics. Um, what is what is the advice that you're giving companies? Yeah, it's definitely it's definitely topical. Um, we actually have done um, a couple of sessions with the broader portfolio um, about operating during a downturn and, and talking about what how we got here and what's driving it all and uh, going forward, what are some recommendations? Um, we actually published one of those as well, uh, decided to do so last minute. Um, so you can find that online. But, um, you know, we actually have defined, we have this table out there that's circulating. It's, you know, you can, you can surface it. Uh, defining the SAS metrics that we think are great, good, and in a danger zone, so to speak, yeah. and that would dictate um, default investable, being in a position where a company uh, can still raise and be on this venture trajectory, um, and, and maintaining, for example, a 3x, just as a hypothetical example, like a 3x year-over-year -year growth in ARR while keeping your burn multiple, you know, less than two. Um, having these conversations, and that's a very high-level, you know, um, tra trajectory, but uh, being able to get into the weeds um, and how to work backwards from that, meaning um, how do you adjust your go-to-market drivers? Uh, uh, what are some drivers around your payroll and um, setting up your sales team, um, moving away from experimental marketing spend to marketing spend that's driven more uh, tied to KPIs or conversion rates. Um, these are conversations we're having real time right now within our portfolio companies. Um, ultimately, to get to some scenario analysis, some semblance of smart scenario analysis in our operating model, so we can ultimately, hopefully, get everybody to a position where they're uh, in a, where they have twenty four plus months of runway is uh, is, is is very uh, relevant right now. So um, we're sharing what we're learning, and this is an ongoing conversation. But we're sharing what we're learning from a fundraising perspective, and and um what the outcomes might look like and then working backwards from that thinking through tactics to be able to ride through um you know what we think is a is going to be a tough uh couple years i really appreciate the focus on like specific benchmarks um i'm curious uh, actually on that no whether there's uh, a couple of metrics that people haven't been paying as much attention to or hasn't been as top of mind when it's all been about uh, you know revenue growth rate um, that you you are emphasizing like you've really got to know these and um, the benchmarks for those yeah um, also we, you know I touched on the burn multiple earlier uh, that's something that um, uh, my partner David Sachs wrote about in 2020 and um, as seems to we started to see this outside of the craft portfolio companies. Um, and that's just a measurement of, um, you know, how efficient the burn is. And I'm, I'm a big fan of that, big fan of capital efficiency. And that's something that we've continued to uh, stress within the portfolio, especially uh, in this shifting macro environment. Um, you know, I think uh, cash payback is one that people often talk about, but having just a more um, tighter focus on uh, not only what it is, 
um, but the drivers to it and hopefully getting to, you know, sub 12 month cap payback yeah. period is definitely, uh, something that we're working on with our portfolio companies. Um, and, um, you know, I think sales efficiency is a big one, especially given that there are a lot of controllable drivers that, uh, dictate that, you know, that measurement, um, as an example, what I said earlier, the one-on-one ratio of sales and marketing spend per month or per quarter to uh, new sales ARR um, in that same time period. Um, and uh, I'm a big fan of that just because it's, um, you know, it's a, it's just a very simple measurement. And so, and there are, as I said, uh, adjustable levers uh, that drive that uh, metric. And so I would say those are, you know, the, those are the um, burn multiple and sales efficiency are definitely uh, KPI metric KPIs that we focus on to make sure that we're moving toward the growth metrics that venture uh, investors may still be focused on while maintaining some efficiency levels. Yeah. Um, I have a sort of randomly nuanced question about sales efficiency. Um, when, when I was building my last business, the main thing that everyone looked at was magic number uh, and sales efficiency wasn't quite uh, like within quarter um, was in, in, on people's radar, but they're really the same thing. The question is whether you, you, you know, uh, offset, uh, the new revenue by a quarter. I've also seen people offset by two quarters or three quarters. And I'm curious, like, what do you think of the, the, the role of these, the set of metrics, uh, where they're all sort of calculating sort of the same thing, except just which time periods you're using the spend and which time period you're using the new, the net new ARR in, um, I'm, I'm curious, like how you think about that, or if you have advice on how businesses might want to pick one or another as the main one that they think about. We have a pretty simple uh, framework for this, and it's really just tied to company sales cycle. Uh, we're big fans of, you know, self-serve companies with a self-serve or product left growth. So if, um, you know, you're acquiring that customer and then in, within 30 days, then we simply align the numbers within that month. Um, if you have a 30 plus day sales cycle, then, you know, we'll do that as we'll, we'll adjust the, uh, the matching, um, of the spend to, to new sales ARR. So it's really just dictated in our minds by the sales sales cycle. Yeah. That makes a ton of sense. So how much you offset when you get the new revenue is sort of directly defined by what your average sales cycle is. Yeah. Right. Right. And again, going back to your earlier question around the offer, you know, how, um, in the weeds or uh, close to the operating kind of day to day uh, are these KPIs? You know, we're if it's a net new and net new uh, company that we're meeting, um, this is this isn't by any means a precise exercise for us as well. We're as coming at this as outsiders, so um, that that's a quick way for us to normalize this. Um, you know, if we were if it were a portfolio company, perhaps there's um, more detailed ways, but. I'm mostly speaking at, to this from a, as a net new perspective. Yep. Right. Um, how has the current environment impacted the way that, um, you're, you're evaluating companies that are pitching you? Yeah, good question. Um, so I don't, I don't think that our, uh, benchmarks that we're seeking have really shifted. Um, we're still, you know, at the series A, broadly speaking, um, you know, hoping for three acts year over year, if the, the threshold of ARR is uh, a million of, or less, you know, um, and there's a sliding scale there as you, as you, as you increase. Um, we're still looking for high gross margins, 70, 80% plus NDR, um, in the 120, um, plus and payback, cash payback period less than, less than 12 months and, all of that with a burn multiple, hopefully less than two. Um, so that was something that we were always, uh, hoping to, you know, hoping to, um, invest in, in terms of the companies we partner with. Um, if I had a call out anything that may have shifted, I would say maybe a more, uh, a focus on the quality of the revenue or durability of your customers. Um, you know, if you're selling predominantly to, um, startups, uh, or SMBs, you know, just trying to understand the potential retention of those companies going forward as I think there's going to be a lot of headwinds around spending, for example, if you're 
a startup selling to another startup um, is, is one example anecdote that has come up in the last couple of months. Um, so th- that's one thing that I would say uh, maybe um, uh, a recent shift. But other than that, in terms of the KPIs, um, not yeah. really. That makes a lot of sense. Um, in an ideal world, are there are there uh, ways that you would want um, management teams to be able to go a level deeper into metrics, whether it's sort of like slicing and dicing things or being able to see things at a more granular level, like the example with retention and cohorts, um, ways that you wish that, or management teams wish that they could go deeper um, and that you think would be really beneficial? Yeah, so it's um, it's a topic that I think about often uh, for the portfolio companies I'm on the board of. And one thing that I think is interesting is thinking about retention um, across customer yeah. profile. And that's dictated by you know the nuances of your business. But a very uh, straightforward example would be SMB, mid-market, or enterprise, um, especially if you have a sales motion that may have been maybe self-serve and you see a certain kind of customer profile coming through that, and then as well as pairing that with the top-down sales motion. And so yeah understanding um, the logo and NRR across customer profile can be interesting, uh, historically speaking, because that may dictate um, refinement in the pricing model. Um, let's say, as an example, you have, um, you know, a small percentage of your ARR is driven by SMB, and you're finding that you're, you're dedicating a lot of upfront costs to onboard and close. Uh, this SMB with a sort of a sales assisted self serve motion. And uh, perhaps the, the way the product is structured, uh, a freemium model for that cohort might make more sense. And when you cut the, the NRR and logo retention for uh, the, the tiers that are more expensive, um, you know, that it's even more outstanding. And it might make more sense strategically to introduce a freemium model to capture this SMB cohort based on. Uh, what you've identified from segmenting out your retention metrics by cus- customer profile. So um, that's one example off the top of my head, but I think it's um, it's a relevant topic around, especially every board meeting for SaaS company, where we're discussing ICP and our go-to-market and all these levers that we can work on uh, to be able to identify uh, or speak to the retention metrics um, um, in a more nuanced way across our customer base. That makes a ton of sense. Yeah, like I think um, at the end of the day, no matter what, how you segment your customers, they're going to have, there's going to be groupings of some sort um, and those groupings are going to behave at least somewhat differently and knowing the answer to what is happening there is probably quite critical to making sure you know where to invest. So that makes so much sense to me. Yeah, yeah, it's definitely, um, it's not a topic that we're able to get into with companies we just meet because obviously the, the lift on that is, is even more intense, but it's definitely something that I hope to get to once we're, um, you know, partners with the company, um, because it, um, you know, it's just an ongoing topic that I find yeah. very relevant. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. Before you go, let me give you a super quick overview of what Subscript is because chances are we can help you. I started Subscript because, uh, in my last business, I had this problem. We had this giant Google spreadsheet, and that's where we kept track of everything about our business. And if you're anything like me, you're a data-driven leader who really cares to understand numbers in order to make sure that you're making the right decisions. But when you're looking at a giant spreadsheet with lots of um, tabs on tabs on tabs and lots of people with access, you're probably not looking at the right thing because you can never be confident that someone didn't mess something up or that someone didn't fat finger a number or that you considered all the corner cases that you actually needed to consider. So that's what Subscript does. We help you understand your subscription business at a much deeper level than you ever thought possible. If you'd be interested in giving it a try, come check us out at subscript.com.